Um, I need your imaginations for a second. I, I want you to picture three strands of yarn hanging in thin air. And I want you to imagine that each of those strands represents the voice of some character in a story. So that if strand one passes in front of strand two, then that means character one is talking to character two, and vice versa. If strand two passes in front of strand one, then that means character two is talking to character one. And I guess if strand one passes in front of both strand two and strand three, you get where I'm going. That probably looks pretty good in your mind. Here's what it would look like on paper. <coughs> this is a snippet from Shakespeare's Hamlet. And when Laertes, character one, talks to Polonius, character two, you not only get this crossing of strand one over strand two, you also get what mathematicians call a braid letter, a little sigma one, two, sigma for strand, one for the character speaking, two for the character spoken to. If you repeat the procedure for the rest of the story, you end up with a nice, beautiful braid. And if you concatenate all of those braid letters end to end, you get what we call a braid word. Groovy? Groovy. Let's change the, uh, the scenario. Let's say I wanted to do a complete study of Little Red Riding Hood, of which there are 1,400 published versions in English alone. I don't know about you, but I'm a college student. That's not happening. I am not about to read 1,400 versions of that story for all the obvious reasons. Um, but I would consider braiding all of those versions because my eyes are good at picking up on visual patterns and because my computer can handle long strings of numbers and letters like those braid words. So here's a sample from some of the earliest published versions uh, of Little Red Riding Hood. And let me take a moment to tease out some of the insights that are hiding in this tapestry. The first, the most obvious, is that chart itself. Show of hands, how many thought that there was really only one version of Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah, here, here, so did I. Um, every single one of these authors adds some sort of mutation to the tale. And the language of mutation here, the, the language of evolution, isn't really too far off the mark. You really are looking at a chronology of this story as though it were a species, as it responds to and gets adapted by the selective pressures of its time. And you really are looking at braids and braid words that can be treated, computationally at least, just like genes. So speaking of species, there are usually two canonical versions of Little Red Riding Hood. The 1697 version by Charles Perrault, in which grandmother and Little Red Riding Hood tragically get eaten, and then there's the 1812 version by the Brothers Grimm, where the hunter comes along and saves the day. I hope I didn't ruin the ending for anyone. That'd be a shame. <laughs> um, and the question is, which of these two versions has been more influential? Which, of course, entirely depends on how you define influential. But what these braids can tell us is that Perrault's version has been more often exactly reproduced than adapted. At least three authors of the 18th and 19th century chose to copy his version, maybe not word for word, but at least braid word for braid word. The Brothers Grimm, however, although theirs is probably the more popular version, were more often adapted than reproduced. And boxed in orange there, you can see two versions that include the saving hunter figure as character number five, but also include significant additions. We haven't resolved the question of influence here, but at least now we have some pretty good metrics to help us out. And you'll note, I haven't made you read a single story yet. So let's do that, actually. Um, let's look at some mutations. In this 1888 version, a new motif emerges that actually constitutes a brand new plot line. In this version, let me actually blow it up for you, um, Wolf is about to devour Red Riding Hood when you know, she's, uh, you know, Red Riding Hood screams, Mama, Mama! And um, Mama doesn't quite appear, but Grandma certainly does. Dominating the conversation in gray there, she boots Wolf out of the picture and then chides her, uh, her granddaughter. And the question here is, hmm, Perrault's version had about 200 years to get popular, and the Grimm's version had about three quarters of a century at this point. What is it about this story and this mutation that makes it that a mere 10 years later, it would be picked up again by a later author? One theory is that at the turn of the century, women's rights are coming to the surface of popular awareness and are entering the discourse of children's literature. If we were to broaden our study to the 20th century, we could look and see if that trend goes anywhere, if it gets mutated further. Another important thing, grandmother, I mentioned, is dominating the conversation, and that's very important. Braiding may not tell us anything qualitative about a story. We can't tell from here if those are 
questions, requests, commands, let alone what tone they're spoken in. But braiding does tell us how much is being said, by whom, and when, or in response to what. And that's vital because the politics of discourse are at stake precisely in moments like these. Who has power, who has agency in any given situation is intimately related to who has a voice and who's using it. So I gave you three strands to begin with. I'll, I'll give you three takeaways. First of all, for literary scholars, braiding provides us two things we've never had before. A computable unit for comparison, but then also a strong sense of chronology, both vertically within one story and then horizontally across multiple ones. Secondly, and more broadly, dialogue, not just between characters in a story, but between pretty much anybody can now be tracked, mapped, and visualized and compared, numerically and visually, in a way that caters both to human curiosity and to computer crunching. In the 21st century, where there are more voices speaking and more ears listening than there ever have been, any tool that can help us organize the chaos of our discussions is gonna be worth its salt, especially if it adds a little color to our lives. Thirdly though, as much as it might seem like it's mathematics that's providing literature with a new tool here, it is also just as much literature that is providing math with a new challenge. If I leave you with anything, I hope I leave you convinced that we have more to gain by letting fields like math and literature intertwine than we do by keeping them apart. Thank you.